Okay, thank you for attending all three sessions. That's, that's amazing, and it's wonderful, and it's a blessing. Um, in this last session, we're going to look at some other aspects of the Word of God. We, we are dealing with some apparent contradictions to what Jesus said and what some of the other writers in the New Testament said. And I hope you will also find this quite in, enlightening. Um, and we are going to deal with a very sensitive subject once again, and that is the day and the hour of the second coming. So if somebody asks you, or if you speak to somebody about the day and the hour, or well, the second coming of the, the Son of Man, what, what do they normally say? Nobody knows the day and the hour. Yeah. Except, for, except for the Father. And what's interesting is that Jesus, when he spoke in Mark 13, verse 30, 31 to 33, said that he even didn't know the day and the hour of his second coming. So, you know, if you are a Christian and you tell an unbeliever that you believe that Jesus is God, how do you reconcile the fact that Jesus didn't know something about his own timing with the fact that he is God as well. And these are the kind of contradictions in the Word of God that I love to dig into and to try to figure out what, what has God hidden for us in this. Because normally when you encounter a contradiction, there's something important hidden in there for us to understand. It's normally, and, and I'll show you as we, as we go about this. So let's get into this. Hopefully the session won't be too long. I'm going to look at um, a bit more detail about the, the two signs that were given to us in Genesis and Revelation 12, and specifically what words we can uh, get from it if we study what the Word tells us about the, the words that the, the heavens declare to us, or the glory of God that the heavens declare to us about the things that He's concealed. And I think you, know, you will also find it quite interesting, I hope so, um, so let's start with Mark 13, verse 31 to 33. It says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and uh, that hour knoweth no man. And see, the Lord says, knoweth. It's present things. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. So in this instance, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. And he said, nobody knows currently what the day and the hour of the return of the Son would be. Only the Father. But then when we read Luke 21 verse 36, he says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. And to stand before the Son of Man. And we also see that Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1 to 5, but of the times and the season, uh, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child. And there again we see the connection to Revelation 12 and Genesis uh, 3, the prophecy in Genesis 3. Uh, and they shall not escape, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. So, in these two passages from Luke and uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, it would seem that it is the Lord's intention for us to know when He comes. Um, and we are not in darkness, we have His word before us, He's also unsealed the information that is kept sealed up or closed up until the time of the end so that we can understand when he's coming. And when we study this in detail, it becomes so evident that you know, he's actually showing us the hour during which the, you know, this, we could expect his return. If we look um, at Luke 21, verse 25 to 28, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. And that's once again coming down to, you know, what has science taught the nations and what is the Word of God telling us and the heavens showing them. The sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear 
and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So, in this passage, what we understand that Jesus is telling his disciples is that, that he will send us signs in the heavens that would notify us of the times that are just ahead in which he will be returning for us. And that, you know, when we see these things beginning to come to pass, and in that sense, I, th I think he specifically refers to this um, sign of the Son of Man that will, return, uh, that will appear in the heavens when Jupiter collides with a different planet. And this is the sign that tells us, you know, this is what, what is going to happen. And how does this all fit in with the feasts or the feast days of, of the Lord? It's, it's sort of generally known that the Feast of Trumpets, from a Jewish perspective, is known as the day that nobody knows the day and the hour of. Amen. It is also known as the, the day for the last trump, in which the last trump is blown. And there's two references in the Word of God where this is specifically highlighted. Um, we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52, uh, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall, shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And this is what links the, the Feast of Trumpets to, to the rapture. And this is where Paul describes to us, when this feast is fulfilled, when the fulfillment of this feast occurs, this is when the dead shall be raised, and this is when um, those that are still alive will be changed from corruptible bodies into incorruptible bodies. Normally, the way in which um, the Feast of Trumpets was celebrated in Israel is that during the entire month of Elul, they have a continuous blowing of the trumpets that occur on every day, and that is to call Israel to repentance and to introspection and to you know, confessing their sins before the Lord. And then on the Feast of Trumpets, they have to decide which day... Uh, could they actually spot the first sliver of the moon, which is then witnessed uh, before the, the Sanhedrin. And when they do this, the last trumpet is sounded. And the last trump is also known as the awakening blast. Um, if we look again at Mark 13, verse 31 to 33, it says, um, you know, but of that day and hour uh, knoweth no man. So once again, I want to focus on the fact that Jesus is saying, present tense. So, uh, and we also need to understand how the Word of God was put together. At the time when Jesus spoke these words, um, the New Testament wasn't written yet. Um, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, and John only wrote the, the Gospels after Jesus um, ascended. Well, well, I suppose uh, we know that Matthew took shorthand, so he probably made some, made some notes during uh, Jesus' ministry. But the, the Gospels were actually only completed after Jesus ascended. And I think this is quite important to understand when we consider what Jesus says in Mark 13, saying that nobody knoweth or knows um, the day and the hour except the, except the Father. But we also have to consider how, does it, how is it possible for Jesus, who is God, who Christians or we that are his children, consider to be God, uh, or his brother, actually, I would say, uh, considered to be God, or the fact that he's equal with the Father, how can we explain the fact that he did not know the, the day and the hour of his second coming? Um, so, and we need to find the answer from um, the, the Word of God as well. And, and what, are this, what are some of the considerations? Um, is it a sin to look for the day? I, I think when you, know, you mentioned the, the day and the hour of the Lord's return, whether you're referring to the second coming or to the rapture, people will normally look at you like you are an evil person, you know, to, to try and correct the word of God. But it's not, it's, it's, it's trying to find what God has concealed in his word. And that is where the, the honor comes in, according to the, to the word of God. He has concealed various things in his word, and it's our honor as kings, according to his word, to search out matters that he had concealed. And, for, and as such, you know, we need to study and understand why or how is it possible for Jesus, who has placed him equal with God, 
to not know the day and the hour of, um, of his second coming. Um, so let's look at 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So what does this, or the fact that Jesus was manifest in the flesh, the flesh tell us about um, his situation? Um, it says that in the, in the beginning, uh, the word... Uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it says that the Word was made flesh. So it says God took on a human form. And this is, he took on the form of a servant also, is, is what we read, and I'll, and I'll get to that. But what it means is that God intentionally limited himself. And we also have to understand that by looking at how we as, as people are put together. We've got a, a spirit. Um, that is born again when we accept Jesus as our, as our Savior. Uh, we have got a, a body that is corrupted, and there's nothing that we can do about our, our body and the fact that it is sinful. The only way we can be reconciled with God as far as our body is concerned is either to die or to receive a glorified body um, at the rapture. Uh, and in between sits our soul, and the soul is our ability to interpret the wisdom that God has poured out in our spirit and bring that through into our intellect. So the only way in which we can really begin to understand um, the mysteries that are contained in the spirit or that the spirit of God pours out into our, um, into our spirits is to, to renew our mind. You know, so you have to constantly give yourself over to the Lord and allow His Spirit to work through you. You have to take your thoughts cap uh, captive and uh, you know, consider what you're thinking about. Um, if you're constantly thinking about negative things, it's going to, to influence your, you know, your intellect as well and your spirit is going to be dark. You know, it's, 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 it's really, you know, the more you, th you ponder the, the Word of God, the more light you receive in your spirit and it comes through into your intellect and you begin to understand things which other people don't understand, you know, so that's, and that's really, if we, if we take how this relates back to the fact that Jesus took on a human form, or the form of a servant, it says basically to us that God decided to, to limit himself willingly, so that he could not know the day and the hour of his second coming when he spoke those words. Also for a, spe a specific purpose, to fulfill what was written in Daniel that said, you know, seal up the words until the time of the end. So, um, I'll go through a few, a few passages. <clears throat> we also understand that um, not all of God's word was written at that point. Um, so, just the, the fact that Jesus is God in the flesh. Here, here are a few passages that we can, um, that we can read through. Uh, Matthew 1 verse 23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. And there's one, once again the Revelation 12 sign and Genesis 3 sign, or prophecy. Uh, shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So that immediately tells us that the virgin's son that will be born will be God with us. John 1 verse 1 to 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So that tells us that Jesus was responsible for everything that was created. Um, in John 5 verse 18 we read, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill Him, because not only had He broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was His Father, making Himself equal with God. So from a Jewish perspective, Jesus... Um, declared that he was God by making himself equal with the Father. And in John 10, verse 17 to 18, we read, Therefore does the, my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So I think you'll agree with me that you know, there's no other person that
that has the power to lay down his life and then the power to take it up again. I mean, that's the only, that, that really proves that Jesus was God, the fact that he could say those words and also perform them. So these are just some passages to, um, to prove the fact that Jesus was indeed God and that he was God in the flesh. So if we read John 10 verse 30 to 33, I and my Father are one. And then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed uh, you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because uh, that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Another, the final passage is John 8, verse 58, And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And that is obviously the same words that were used by um, God in the burning bush when he was speaking to Moses, saying that I am what I am. And so there's definitely enough evidence in the word of God to prove that Jesus claimed to be God. And I mean, obviously we accept that as a fact as well. The word of God would have us understand that Jesus is God. Um, and if Jesus was sinless, he was truly telling the truth when he said that only the Father had knowledge of the, the timing of the second coming. If we consider the fact that, you know, if Jesus was God, but he actually knew the, the timing of the second coming, he would have been lying when he said that not the Son, or well, the Son does not know the day and the hour. So there's definitely a limitation that comes in with our understanding, you know, when, when Jesus came to earth in the form of a servant, and I think some of the passages that I'll read next will, will actually speak to that. And let's just see how these passages confirm to us that Jesus was, in fact, sinless. It says in 1 Peter 3, verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. That tells us that he was sinless, and that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And in Hebrews 5, verse 8 to 9, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, once again sinless, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. In Hebrews 4 verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. So there's ample evidence in the word of God that Jesus was completely sinless. So how do we understand this? And Paul provides us with uh, some answers in the letters to uh, the churches of Rome, Romans and Corinth, and also actually in Philippians. Um, and it has to do with Jesus being born into a mortal body and becoming a servant unto death. So although when he was uh, God in the spirit before his birth, he knew everything, he made everything, he, uh, adapted, in, or he adapted himself into the body of a mortal being, who has a, a spirit, a soul, and a body, uh, and the body did not know everything that the spirit knows. And we can also see evidence of that uh, in Scripture, which I'll, which I'll get to. In Philippians 2, verse 5 to 9, we read, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also, or also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So this is a, a, prophecy, a prophecy that was actually fulfilled, which we read about in Psalm 78, verse 40 to 41. And, and this explains to us the reason why God had to adopt, uh, you know, a, a limited form in the form of a human being, um, which, is, which is mortal. Uh, only the fact that he was mortal already tells us, you know, before his, before his resurrection in a glorified body, tells us that he was limited because he could die. Um, and in Psalm 78, verse 40 to 41, we read the following. How oft did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yeah, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. So it means that because of our sins, God had to limit himself in order for, to die for, for us as a sinless offer in order to pay for our 
trespasses and sins. So in, in Mark 6 verse 4 to 6 we read, But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, um, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could do there no mighty works. And you see, in this instance, because of people's unbelief, he could not perform miracles. And that's once again <clears throat> an, an example of the fact that Jesus was limited in his abilities in a mortal body. Um, save he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villagers teaching. So once again, it, it, it boils down to understand, understanding the, the body, soul and spirit connection. So uh, when we become born again, you know, I've, um, it's, it's sort of recently that I discovered the exact context of what it means when you are joined unto the Lord. You know, you would normally think when you're born again, uh, the Lord comes and live, lives in you with His Spirit, um, but you don't quite understand the connection between your spirit and His Spirit. Well, that for me was the case anyway. But when we read 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17, it says, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So that means when he comes and lives in us, we have the Holy Spirit in us. Um, you know, that, that's basically the center of our being. And there's further evidence of this um, that we find um, where, where John writes that as Christ is, so are we in this world. But there's really no cure for our corruptible flesh. So in Romans 7 verse 18, we says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is pr present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Um, and then also, if we consider how Paul saw himself, he wrote in, I think it's Philippians 3, that he was, as far as the law is concerned, he was perfect, he was blameless. He, he, he called himself blameless as far as keeping the law is concerned. He was a Pharisee. But even given the fact that he was uh, blameless as far as keeping the law is concerned, he spoke the words that we read in Romans 7, 7 verse 24, where he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So in our body, this physical body that we have, there is nothing good. Um, we are born into sin, this unfortunately, and we have got physical bodies that cannot please God in any way or any sense. And, you know, when we understand that, we begin to focus on what does it mean when the Holy Spirit becomes part of our spirit, you know, and it becomes one with our spirit. And how does it, how does it, what does it mean to, to renew our minds, or, you know, and how does that, that information that becomes, um, or the wisdom, I suppose, that becomes evident from renewing your mind and transferring the, vis the wisdom that is in our spirits into our intellect, how does that change you? Um, it, be it gives us the desire to be pleasing unto the Lord, but we realize that we have these bodies of death that's sinful, that is not pleasing to the Lord. Um, you know, so there's also a, a contradiction that we have to understand as, that's, as far as that's concerned. But this is really where we understand how it was possible for for Jesus to say that he didn't know the day and the hour um, while he was in a mortal body. He was, uh, when he was conceived with the Holy Spirit, uh, he was 100% the Holy Spirit in him, um, but he also had the mortal body. And the same principles that apply to, to our mortal bodies and for us to be able to uh, delve into the wisdom that is made available in our spirit, you have to do that by the renewing of your mind. Obviously, it started a lot earlier for Jesus because he didn't have sin. Um, he was also brought up through a, a Jewish upbringing. And, um, you know, for them, they, they start very early with studying the Word of God. And I think the fact that he was receptive for the Spirit without sin being a hindrance for, you know, for his intellect. And that is why at 12 years old, he could go to the temple and teach people about the Word of God. So I think it's quite interesting when you delve into these aspects and begin to understand it. So we understand that when Jesus lived in a mortal body, it is God limiting himself. Renewing of the mind allows the spirit to manifest to some degree through the flesh. So, you know, the more we renew our minds, the more we begin to understand the, the glory of God that lives within us in his Holy Spirit. And in Romans 12 verse 2, this is, uh, is explained to us and it says, and be not conformed to this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Jesus was subject to the laws applied to the living or uh, to living in the in the flesh, but completely sinless. And as such, you know, there were some restrictions that we have that that he didn't have, um, as as far as you know, our sinful natures are concerned. And Luke 2 verse 52 also says that, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Which means that it was also a process of growth and there was certain information that the Holy Spirit never allowed his physical body or the intellect in his physical body to comprehend. And the only thing, this is also very important to understand, that the Bible highlights for us, you know, and the, uh, the Word tells us that Everything written in the Word is for our instruction. So the fact that the Holy Spirit highlighted to us that uh, there was certain information that Jesus didn't know is also very important because we have to focus on it because it was written for a reason. So I'll, I'll show you how, how we find out what it, what, it was, what it means as we continue. But we know that Jesus was therefore completely truthful when saying that he did not, did not know the day and the hour of his second coming. Because if he was lying, he would not have resurrected from the dead. Um, and yeah, so we, we know he is God and he was trying he was telling the truth. What insight does it give us when uh, we know or what does it mean when we are being born again? Um, the Bible tells us that we become the temple of God. In 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Um, we become like Jesus was, only difference is our sinful nature that we only get rid of once our body dies or is transformed. And we are obviously looking forward to the transformation. Uh, in 1 John 4 verse 17 it says, Herein is our love made uh, perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And it's very important to look at the, the <coughs> tenses as well, you know, so, or uh, the timing of, of uh, what he's referring to. So as he is currently, so are we in this world. So um, when we are born again, we become just like Jesus is. Uh, and we also, when we, when we are transformed into, into new glorified bodies, it says we will see him as he is. Um, so, once again, just to say that Jesus did not lie, uh, even though he was God. Uh, but we also have to remember that Jesus did not remain in a mortal body. That's also very important to consider. Um, what happened after Jesus was resurrected in a glorified body? Does the word tell us anything about information being revealed to Jesus um, after he was resurrected and uh, ascended into heaven? Um, when we understand this information, it changes our focus. And like I said, instead of wondering what Jesus meant by saying that nobody knows the day and the hour, it focuses our attention on why did the Holy Spirit guide the writers of the Gospels, which were paying a lot of attention to detailing the fact that it's the day and the hour that is not known. Um, and why would this be included in the book? You know, Why did the Holy Spirit highlight one thing for us that Jesus recognized not knowing or admitted that this was not knowledge that he had. And that is quite important to, to remember because um, we read in Psalm 40 verse 7 that he says, Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me. So everything written in both the Old and New Testaments is telling us something about Jesus. And in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, we see all scriptures is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So it is important for us to understand you know, the meaning behind what the Holy Spirit allowed to, to be written into the Word. What do we know about the Word of God at the time when Jesus made the statement about the day and the hour? So if we look at the timeline over which the Bible was put together, we have um, Genesis being written, or basically the first five books of the law of the Torah, uh, at around 1450 BC. Um, and at that point, you know, there's 
only the information in those five books that were revealed to uh, those who were in Israel. I mean, the rest of the world didn't have any of the knowledge. It was only revealed to Israel at that time. And Jesus' statement of uh, when he said about the day and the hour that nobody knew um, except the Father was made sort of close to the end. Um, and we know that the, the final books were written around 1980, you know, Revelation, the book of Revelation. And so it, he didn't say that at the end. It, he said it before the end came, and the whole New Testament actually followed uh, what Jesus, or Jesus said to his disciples concerning the day and the hour of, of his second coming. So if we look at this on the timeline, we see that there's a progressive revelation of God uh, to, uh, to people over time. And this is over a period of about 1,600 to 1,700 years during which the, the Bible was put together. And as time progressed from when Genesis was written, the information that was revealed increased, obviously, as, as more books were, were added to the, the Bible. And this is basically the Old Testament time, and at the end of the Old Testament, Jesus said those words. And after, after the, um, Jesus said those words, the New Testament was written. Uh, at the time when the, the law was given to Moses, the only information available was, you know, sort of at that where the finger is pointing. Uh, and that's the only information that was available. It doesn't mean that the rest of the Bible is untrue. It just means it hasn't been revealed yet. Just to give you an analogy, if we look at somebody in the 1600s saying that the fastest way to travel is on horseback, would that be a true statement from his position in time? Yes. So, I mean, there was no technology at that point in time to, you know, help them to travel faster on the land. Uh, however, if we move to our situation in time at the moment, if we made the same statement, it would no longer be true. Because we've got the ability to travel a lot faster in today's life than they could in the 1600s. And this is just to, to show you how we should also approach the Bible and look at when certain things was, were said to understand, you know, is there more information that uh, the Holy Spirit revealed to us through more books that were added later, um, and which could maybe change the, the perspective uh, that we have about what was said. So many people will, if you talk about the day and the hour, will say, no, this is off off-limits topic. This is what God said. This is the end. You can't, uh, don't even touch that and, and look further at it. But I mean, we always have to dig deeper and try to understand what, what it is that the Lord wants to reveal to us. Um, at the point when Jesus uh, made that statement, uh, the complete Old Testament was available. But obviously the New Testament was still um, not written. So if we move on, you can see there's this little green triangle at the top that includes some information that only those who would have the New Testament would also uh, be able to discover. And it's quite interesting to see how much more information you have when you take both the New and the Old Testament and, and marry the two together. Um, and I think this is also part of the reason why Israel is blinded. They've rejected half of God's word. And as such, they only have half a puzzle that they're working with. You know? So they, they can't put the pieces together to see how things are matching up. They are unaware of the, the um, connection between Revelation 12 and Genesis 3. They know about Genesis 3, but they don't know that it, it represents a, a heavenly signal because they reject what, what's written in Revelation. So, you know, when you have the, f the complete work with a uh, word, with all the pieces together, it becomes a lot easier to, to put things together and, and to understand what, what goes on. The Holy Spirit's intention in highlighting the day and the hour, so let's dig into that a bit. Um, so we know that Jesus spoke to his disciples and, and told them, and it was recorded several times, that only the Father knows about the day and the hour. In Revelation 1 verse 1 to 3, we read the following, and this is so amazing. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. So, there is specific information that the Father gave to Jesus, and it says that he has to show unto his servants things what, uh, which must shortly come to pass. Okay? So, 
God the Father gave specific information to Jesus after he ascended into heaven. And we know what that information has to do with because the Holy Spirit has already prompted us um, what that information entails. Um, it has to do with his second coming. It has to do with the day and the hour of his second coming. And he sent and signified, signified it by his angels. So what does it mean to signify? He turned it into a sign. Uh, and what does the word of God tell us about signs? It is a marker in the heaven that points out the feast day. Uh, and that is what uh, you know, he created the heavens for, is to be, to be signs pointing out his feast days. And he gave that unto John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So once again, the sign has to do with the time. You know, so this three verses already explains to us everything that we're struggling to understand as far as the day and the hour is concerned. Once we understand you know, some of the background information as well. Genesis 1 verse 14 tells us that the signs uh, are found in the heavens and they are meant to point to, to the feast days and also to show us days and years. Uh, and in Revelation 20 verse 10 it says, And he says, uh, and says unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So once again, uh, the fact that our Heavenly Father has revealed to us the, the book of Revelation tells us that it is now his desire for us to understand what he has revealed to us in these books. And we can only understand it when we have the complete word of God and we use it as puzzle pieces, you know, search for sections that fit together in order to understand um, how this all fits together. So if we look at the, the fulfillment that has occurred during um, the feast, or, or the, the Lord's feast, um, we can see that all the spring feasts have already been fulfilled by Jesus. And also note that, you know, although we have multiple events that could happen or that could happen on these events, like when Israel uh, escaped Egypt during the Exodus, this was also a fulfillment of Passover. It wasn't, however, the one that was marked by the Lord with the heavenly sign, because it wasn't fulfilled by Jesus himself. And I think that is where we also have to clarify and understand, you know, which of these feasts would he mark with specific signs in the heavens. And we know that we had the three-hour eclipse on, on Passover when Jesus was crucified. He also fulfilled the first fruits, unleavened bread, and Pentecost. And we know that the very next feast due for fulfillment is the Feast of Trumpets, which occur on September uh, 21st to 23rd this year. And it is also marked with a very unique um, heavenly sign that we can interpret as the sign of the end when we understand what the, what the end looks like by looking at the beginning. So it's, it's really important to, to know we are entering uh, the, the last few days before the Feast of Trumpets will be fulfilled. There, there have been studies done on whether there are other signs like this that mark uh, feast days and there's nothing else out there. It's only those two, the one in Genesis 3 and the one in Revelation 12. And obviously, you know, it, it's very significant to take that into account. So, obtaining understanding of the day and the hour, how do we go about to understand what the Lord is showing us with regards to obtaining an understanding? Once again, Genesis 1 verse 14, I apologize if I repeat this so many times. <laughs> But uh, it's given to us to understand that he uses the heavens as signs um, to point out his seasons. Revelation 12, verse 1 to 4 says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. This is the only great sign of the end time that is described to us. I'm not going to read through all of it again. And in, by knowing this information, we can then relate it through Revelation 1, verse 1. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God the Father gave unto Jesus, or him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel unto the servant John. So the information that was passed on to Jesus was turned into a sign so that we could understand uh, the meaning of in the end time. And that obviously has to do with the Revelation 12 sign. 
Um, once again, just looking at Daniel 12, verse 8 to 9, we, uh, Gabriel told Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And we want to look at some of the, the interesting words that will come out of the, the signals in the heavens that we'd like to just show you as well. Um, and then, once again, the fact that, that Paul um, did not allow himself to, to say what he saw in the heavens, also because of the fact that he was not allowed to make known some of the information that he was shown with regards to the time of the end. Ob obviously, Paul was shown the event of the rapture, because he explains to us the dead will rise first, and then those who are alive will be changed, and together they will be caught up into the air. So he must have, the Lord must have shown him that in order for him to be able to describe that information to us. But it, it also says that it was not lawful for man to utter uh, those, you know, all of those words. So the Lord allowed Paul to describe some of the events, but not to reveal the timing of exactly when this will happen. Um, in Titus 2 verse 13, we read, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus, Jesus Christ. And when we read that passage, we understand the reason why our Heavenly Father did not allow this information to be made known to people living before our generation. If people living in the 1200s, for instance, knew that the rapture would only happen in, in 2017, they would have no hope um, looking forward to the, you know, to the, to the return of, of our Savior. So, and I think this is a property of our Father. He's a loving Father. He wants everybody to be excited about his return. If you knew that it would, wouldn't happen in your lifetime, it, would you be excited about it? No. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's, it's part of his character that comes through. The, this is the reason why he would, he would keep this information hidden and only reveal it to those who would be living in the time of the end. And it's to, to give his love to those who would live in the 2,000 years prior to, this, to these signs um, or to these events happening. We're going to look at some of the some more of the information on the, the signs themselves. And once again we look at the the dial of your watch as the actual constellations. Then the, uh, the sun is, is basically indicating hours, the, the planets or the wandering stars, the minutes, and the the moon seconds. So if we look at the the Revelation 12 sign, it says uh, the moon was under her feet. So as long as the moon uh, is above or even aligned with the feet, that sign cannot be true. So it needs to be under the, f under the feet, and it is true as soon as it moves from being perfectly aligned to just under the, under the feet. Then you can say, okay, this sign is now true. And if we look at the, the time at which perfect alignment occurs on the 23rd of uh, September, we can see from Israel's perspective, it is at 18.45, so that's about quarter to seven their time, um, they on daylight savings time, uh, in South Africa we don't use that, so it'll be an hour earlier for us, so that's great. And so it's, it's uh, basically a quarter to six is when this sign will be fulfilled, um, or begin to be fulfilled. If we look at the, the hour after perfect alignment, you can see that the moon is just uh, moved an hour further down uh, under the feet of the woman. And you can see that goes up to, from Israel's perspective, to a quarter to eight. And then if we look at date and time, this is a, a website that shows you the uh, basically sunrise and sunset and times of twilight, etc. You can see that this sign occurs exactly during twilight. And a daylight uh, in Israel ends at 1834, and it's completely dark at 1955, which uh, they are basically circled in the, the bottom section of that. Uh, I don't think you can really see what's, what's written there, it's so small. But uh, I've put together this little chart again, just to show you how accurate the, the Lord is with providing his signs, just as he did during the crucifixion of Jesus when he was on the cross, the fulfillment matched exactly the time that he was on the cross. Um, this sign's fulfillment is supposed to be during twilight because that is when the two witnesses will be witnessing. That's the only time when you can really see the, the first sliver of the, the new moon. 
Um, and as such, we see that the fulfillment of this sign is, is designed in such a way that it fits right into this uh, transition from the 23rd to the 24th. So very accurate. And obviously that means something. I mean, uh, if it was you know, slightly off you know, on the side or so, then you could say, yeah, maybe, maybe not. But it is so accurately with you know, 10 minutes on each side almost, you can't get it more accurate than that. And once again, Isaiah 46, verse 9 to 10, that says, or actually verse 10, that says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Um, that is, that's really important to understand because we also need to, to look at what the sign of Genesis or the, 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 the heavenly signal that he's giving us at Genesis 3, where the first prophecy was spoken, what does that really tell us? Because there are a number of aspects that, that are conveyed or words that are spoken by these celestial um, bodies that are in the heavens. So, once again, just comparing the, the two signs again, you can see that we've got these three uh, planets or wandering stars that form part of uh, this sign in both instances. Uh, for the first one, or the, the top one, is at 3915 BC. We've got uh, Mercury, Venus, and Saturn, uh, which, are the, which make up those three planets. And in 2012, we've got Mercury, Mars, and Venus. And that also tells us something. I'll, I'll get to that in a few minutes. And we also have this difference between uh, Genesis 3, where Jupiter is shown as being both from, from Virgo uh, in the top frame, with the moon at the feet, which basically signals the fulfillment, just as I've shown you um, earlier, when the, move, uh, when the moon moves past the being perfectly aligned with the feet of the woman. Um, so this, the moon actually tells us this is, this is my marker or my second hand uh, that indicates when specifically this sign is being fulfilled. Uh, the same is true for Revelation 12's signal. In this case, we've got Jupiter slightly further away from Virgo, um, also when the, the moon is under the feet. So there's, a, there's something significant to understand between the position of Jupiter um, relative to Virgo when these fulfillments take place, and we'll get into that. In Job 38 verse 31, God says to Job, Canst thou uh, bind the, the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? So you can see that the Lord is referring to constellations and to star clusters in his word. So it's not something evil if you talk about these things. Or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? And knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? So in, the, in that question, um, oh, sorry, I've, I left out, canst thou bring matter of the season? And that, that is specifically to do with the constellations. Can you bring forth the constellations in its season? Um, so the matter of is, comes from, it's, it's a Hebrew background, uh, and it, according to Dr. Chuck Messler, he says the Maseroth has nothing to do with astrology or any attempt to tell our futures based on the stars. Rather, the Maseroth is a tool that uses the stars to tell a story. So, and I think that is very important because this is what God has given us. It's this hidden message which we can understand by uh, reading his word and understand what he's telling us from the heavens about timing. And that is really um, what this all comes down to. I've recently watched a, a video by Pastor Mark Corral in which he discusses the uh, references to the moving stars or planets and their meaning as portrayed in the Word of God. So by looking at the planets and where, th where they are connected to information in the Word of God, we see that um, Mercury uh, or Mercurius is associated with Gabriel. And Gabriel is the angel that is considered to be God's messenger. He will always be presenting people with messages, and specifically Daniel, obviously. Um, and we find a reference to this in Acts 14, verse 12, where it says, and they called Barnabas Jupiter, because he was the quiet person, and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. So who's the chief speaker in God's angelic realm? 
Gabriel. So we already know that Mercurius or Mercury uh, tells us that it has to do with a message. Or, you know, it, it represents Gabriel. It has to do with a message. Uh, the second one, Jesus, um, is, uh, is associated with Venus in Revelation 22, verse 16. Uh, he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So where is the bright and morning star? Or what is the bright and morning star? It is Venus. So we associate it with, with uh, Jesus. Um, Mars, that is normally associated with war. Um, and Michael is represented as God's warring angel. Uh, we read that in Revelation 12 verse 7. He says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought at his angels. And the same with Saturn. Saturn has got rings around, rings of dust. You will eat dust all the days of your life. So Saturn represents Satan, and then Jupiter is the king planet. So the king planet um, obviously represents God. Um, so if we take that into account when we look at uh, this information, and once again we have to take into account the fact that uh, Psalms 19 tell us that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. And the, the final sentence in this passage is really important. It says the words uh, go to the end of the world. And that is really the intention of God's uh, hiding the information uh, as explained to Daniel. Is it was intended for us to, uh, to uncover that and to understand that. And uh, Matthew 24 verse 30, once again it says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heavens. And this is the event that really uh, triggers all of the events in Revelation. As soon as the bruising of the two planets occur, that is when the events that will finally culminate in the return of our Lord uh, to the earth um, will happen, and that will be visible to everybody on earth. So if we look at those three planets under uh, Leo, what can we understand from them, and what do they tell us? Because obviously they're speaking forth something that we have to understand given the knowledge that we've uh, just discussed. So if we look at Mercury, Venus, and Saturn, it basically tells us it's a message about Jesus and Satan. If you, t if you take the, the associated understandings uh, with those three planets. And if we read what is written in uh, Genesis 3 verse 15 specifically, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. So who are they? Basically Jesus and Satan. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So, you know, even looking at those three uh, stars, it actually tells us that we have made the right association between the sign in the, uh, the sky or the heavens and the prophecy that was given to us in Genesis 3. If we, look, if we do the same thing <clears throat> for the, the three planets at the bottom, it says, message about Jesus' war. And in Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9, it says, and there was war in heaven. So, you know, even the the constellations and the alignments that we see in the heavens tell us what is written in the Word of God, what confirms God's Word to us, and we know that His intention was for us to, to understand this. <clears throat> then the final thing we need to look at is, how do we understand the position of Jupiter um, that differs between these two alignments? Uh, and then once again, we look at the fulfillment. If you, uh, so if you look at what Genesis 3 is about, it, it tells us about the bruising of the two seeds, uh, the one bruising the head and the other bruising the heel. Uh, and this shows us the timing or the relative position of Jupiter with regards to Virgo when these events are supposed to take place. In the second alignment, or the Revelation 12 alignment, we are looking at the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets in, that, in this, in this uh, specific case. And both of these are actually telling us events that will happen at the end. Because the first uh, alignment that we find in 3915 BC tell us what the end will look like. So it starts off by Jupiter being born from, the, from Virgo when a specific event occurs. And this is the bruising of the, uh, the two seeds. 
And then two weeks later, Jupiter is positioned at the second point, or at the in the bottom uh, graphic. And this is where the Feast of Trumpets of, is, is fulfilled. So it, the Lord is even giving us dates uh, as far as these two events are concerned for us to look at. Um, if we look at the alignment and positioning Jupiter at the point where we are shown it, it should be from the Genesis 3 uh, alignment, <clears throat> but actually now looking at 2017, just positioning it at the same spot, we can then find the, the actual alignment if we zoom in. I don't know if you can actually see the blue line there, um, but you'll see when I go to the next slide, uh, we basically have almost a similar looking alignment with uh, Callisto still inside the, the, uh, the woman. Ganymede is preceding Jupiter out of the womb, and Jupiter is sort of just outside the womb. And I think this occurs um, in 3914, this is when the moon was directly aligned with the feet. So this is the, the marker that you would look, look at, or this is what Jupiter's configuration would look like at that fulfillment. Uh, and we, uh, we then go to 2017 and position Jupiter at that same spot and look at the, the matching confirmation. You, you have Callisto once again inside the womb, Ganymede is, is preceding Jupiter and Jupiter is just outside the womb. So, you know, it's, it's truly showing us the end from the beginning if you study these, uh, these signs. And what this comes down to is what we started off with, and this is the bruising of uh, Jupiter, which is the sign of the Son of Man, which will appear <coughs> in the heavens um, soon. So how do we prepare for this? I mean, is there, how, how do you feel about this? Is this something that you're afraid of, or this, is this something that you're excited about? Okay. Oh, glad, oh. yes. <laughs> I think many people, you know, that I've seen it so often, and I, I'm just going to talk about this for a bit. Um, I'm not going to carry on for much longer. I think I've, I've conveyed most of the information uh, as far as the sign in the heavens are concerned. But, you know, when it comes to for us being prepared, what can we do um, to make sure that we are ready to meet the Lord and that we'll actually be found worthy to, to escape these things that will come upon the earth? And, you know, I've wondered about that for... Uh, or a lot, or many times, or many years through my life, and you know, it is such assurance that when we understand the Father's love for for us, and I think it also comes down to the intimacy that we have with Him. You know, if we are intimate with Him, then we will know these these things, and you know, we will understand that He's shown it to those that are closest to Him, um, because He wants us to be aware of the fact that he's going to come back soon and it boils down to it, it's not going to come down to what can we do in performance it, it goes to our personal relationship with him you know do we love him do we are we excited about his return are we saying you know there's nothing in this world that that will um, be more important to me than looking for his return there's so many people that I encounter that says, no, you mustn't return now because I still want to see my children. I still want to get married. I still want to do this. I still want to do that. Is that really the attitude that, that our Lord wants from those who are yeah. excited about His return? We are focused on things in the world that are so, you know, there's really no value in it. If you, you, know, if you want to make money or you want to achieve certain things in your life, is, is that really what's important to you? Um, the most important thing is that you have a relationship with the Lord, with our Lord Jesus, that you are daily in conversation with Him. I mean, it's similar to if you go to a, if you are about to get married. If a bride that is about to get married, you know, she knows the day is that day, uh, but she actually wants to go and visit her friends on that day. How would the bridegroom feel when when he pitches up and she's partying with her friends? It won't, it won't be a, you know, the, the kind of relationship that you would expect between uh, two people that are going to get married. The bride would be consumed with the, the events that will happen in a few days. I mean, there's nothing else that she can think about. She will think about the dress. She, she will think about, you know, has she prepared everything for the wedding? And 
Yeah, that's the kind of attitude that the Lord wants in His in His bride, you know. And it's it's nothing more than that, you know. You don't have to, in my opinion, once again, you don't have to do things to become something. And that's the that's what the religions of this world expect of their people. The only way in which you can achieve certain things is by working at it, you know. And that's the that is the what it for, for me means to overcome the flesh. Um, our fleshly desire is to do works in order to impress the Lord. But it's, His Word says that our righteous works are as filthy rags to Him. It, it comes down to our intimacy with Him and how we relate to Him. You know, are we excited about Him? Are we looking forward to spending eternity with Him? And I can't wait for, for that day to, to come. I'm ready now. So, um, And yes, we need to be ready every day. I mean, we can die before the 23rd of September. Uh, when the Feast of Trumpets will be fulfilled and when I expect um, our Lord to be very precise in fulfilling his, his uh, prophesied, uh, or this prophesied event. But, I mean, it, it just boils down to us being excited about it. it it's similar to the, the uh, parable of the Ten Virgins as well. The, you know, before the announcement of the bridegroom was made, all of them were fast asleep. So there's no, no difference that you can really detect at that point before the announcement was made. So what is the announcement? It is knowing about the fact that he's returning. There's a, there was a cry at midnight that was made that woke all of them up. But then the one group was discovered to have extra oil and the others did not have oil. And what does that mean? And if we go back to Daniel, it says that in the... In the um, the words will be closed up and sealed until the time of the end, and only the wise will understand. Amen. So, you know, you can already see how the understanding of this additional information that the Lord will make known to us during the time of the end is linked to the additional oil that the wise virgins will have. And people, I, I, just, I see it so often, when I share this information with them, they are completely closed up, they reject all of this, they... Yeah. They choose to hang on to their traditional beliefs, you know, so they would rather prefer what somebody taught them rather than study the word for themselves Amen. to see whether what is being said is actually true or not. And I think that is the attitude that the Lord is looking for in the, the bride and those that, are, that have extra oil, um, is to look for, look for the deeper meaning that He's given us. And I mean, you would know when the Lord returns, if you are close to Him, because He's going to reveal that information to you. Yeah. Um, there's no bride that will be surprised on her wedding day by our bridegroom. I mean, that is not so, it's not something that will happen. I mean, it's a it's a, a joint planned effort that you that you go into when you plan your marriage. Um, I know in the Jewish context, the the bride would stay, uh, you know, at her parents, and the bridegroom would arrive, but she would still know. I mean. When he's coming, he, she needs to not be ready, and uh, so that he, so that she can accompany her bridegroom when they go back to his father's house. So, and obviously, he will send some messengers and tell him, uh, tell her, listen, yeah. I'm planning to come and fetch you on that day, so please make sure you're ready. So that's basically all I have to say about this. I hope this was a, a blessing to you. Obviously, like I said, I don't understand everything. But I've shared with you what the Lord has revealed to me. I hope it makes sense. And I, I hope that you will also study this information and um, dig deeper into it. And maybe the Lord will reveal more of this to you. And if you find something where you can clearly see that the word disagrees with what I said, um, I want you to show it to me so that I can adjust my view on, on what I've uh, um, understood from the word of God. Because my desire is just to... I have no contradiction between my understanding and the Word of God. And that's really all that I want to do. And, yeah, thank you. And the Lord bless you all and I keep you all and makes His face shine upon you. And I look forward to meeting Him in the air on September the 23rd.